The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the guests' own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of AIHA. AIHA does not endorse any guest or the entity that they represent. On this episode of Healthier Workplaces, he is an associate professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the director of Harvard's Healthy Buildings Program. During the COVID pandemic, he became a prominent advocate for improving our indoor environments with regular appearances on network broadcasts and social media. He recently was featured on an episode of 60 Minutes and is the co-author of Healthy Buildings, How Indoor Spaces Can Make You Sick or Keep You Well. Coming up next, I discuss the future of the indoor environmental industry with Dr. Joe Allen. Stay with us. Are you an occupational and environmental health and safety professional looking for additional education and development opportunities? AIHA University's virtual conferences, one more way to receive professional development that's right on the mark for you. Consider, no travel is required. Instead, learning comes directly to you at your home or office. Industry experts deliver live demonstrations via up-to-date video conference technology. Experience the same group activities, practice exercises, and breakout sessions as you would in person. Miss something or want to review a particular point? Full access to the course recording is provided post-event. Our next virtual conference is happening soon. Visit aiha.org slash elearning for more information and to register. Welcome, Joe. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, on the Healthier Workplaces show. It's great to have you. Um, you know, just I guess as an aside, uh, you know, I, I know you have a really busy schedule because you're, uh, you know, you're one of the high profile people uh, in the indoor environmental industry right now, um, which is a good thing, right? Yeah. So any, for first, thanks for having me on. <laughs> and uh, absolutely never too busy to, to chat and talk about uh, my favorite topic, healthy buildings and where this um kind of field is is uh is going so i think everyone in our field has been i think extra busy ever since covid hit and the public's interest has spiked around these issues of indoor air quality how to keep people safe in a building so i imagine there's lots of us in this space who are uh, extra busy in a good way i think the message is starting to get out absolutely well this is a unique moment in time right as you mentioned with the covid pandemic i think it's the first time at least i think in my life i can remember that uh the general public was attuned to indoor environments at least, at least to this degree. So I think that's I, I think that's right. I, I always joke that um, you know my neighbor now talks to me about MERV thirteen filters, um, and she borrowed one of my air quality monitors and reports back on what's happening you know in buildings around town. So no, nope, you know even when I was first hired at Harvard in this field, there was questions about you know well, what is this field? What's this topic? What's the relevance? It feels niche maybe, but um, certainly that changed. I think our field did a really good job during the pandemic with partners of. Um, of raising this issue of airborne transmission for COVID, which then, of course, uh, influences the conversation around influenza RSV and then opens the door to these wider conversations. Well, what else matters besides infectious disease? What are the many benefits? What are the economic and financial benefits of having good, uh, a healthy workplace? Um, and then what else matters beyond air quality? We talk about water quality and lighting, acoustics. So things that didn't get attention, but um, have certainly opened up the door to these wider conversations. It's a real, it's a, it's a real moment. Well, you, you recently on, on social media mentioned that the sick buildings era is over. You know, I, I think as recently as this week, and I, I, I have to follow up on that because uh, I, I'm interested. You know, what, why are you saying that, and how, how does that more importantly affect industrial hygienists and OEHS professionals? You know, in this new era moving forward. Well, so th there's a lot of implications here. Um, and one, I think the biggest is, is the public's health. And so what is the sick building era? I, I think it's been the past at least 40 years where we've had design standards for buildings that have not been designed with a health first mindset in place where buildings are underventilated, uh, poor filters, just we haven't had a focus on our buildings. It took COVID, it's mashing up a building stock that wasn't prepared to kind of open people's eyes to this. So I say the sick building era is over. I actually said it's the beginning of the end of the sick building era because now people are paying attention 
to these things and the, the movement to towards how do we design and operate buildings the correct way? What does that look like? I think it's a big shift for our field. I'm a certified industrial hygienist. Where my pen? Um, I, I train and teach uh, in occupational health, and um, uh, some of IH and CIH is really important. Occupational health of chasing down these problems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what goes wrong? How do we fix them? How do we put in controls? And a lot of that work is also preventative and proactive. How do you put in controls to keep people safe so these things don't happen in the first place? I think the big shift is that we're starting to see this transformation about, um, you know, what are the pro benefits of a healthy indoor environment? Not just industrial controls, putting in controls for like intense hazards, but also what's the benefit of improving air quality even marginally on things like worker cognitive function and performance, which traditionally hasn't been the target of what we try to do with occupational regulation and, and occupational exposure limits. So I think it's an expanding, it's, it's an exciting time for our field, I'll say that. I think the other thing um, is that the, the tools are changing. And I don't just mean the tools towards low cost sensors available to CIHs, but the tools are changing in terms of what's available to the public. So that's really different. People can now see what's happening in their space in a way that they never could before. It was cost prohibitive before for a member, a person of the general public. Sure. I mean, I mean, the term sick building uh, syndrome, though, that, that was always kind of a misnomer, wasn't it? Because buildings aren't sick necessarily. It's the occupants, right? Well, but it's the yeah. buildings that's the causative agent. If you go to root cause, yeah, it's the sick building. I take causative agent up further and say, okay. if you want to get to root cause, it's the standards that determine our building codes that made the building sick that's going to make the occupant sick. I don't mind the term. I mean, sick building syndrome has been in use for a long time, 40 wow. something years. Um, I, you know, you could argue the same thing. Well, buildings can't be healthy. I actually think they can, and they can, they can be sick for sure. I've seen this. I've, I've investigated hundreds of these sick buildings where the building is actually the root cause and is ultimately the cause of the illness uh, in, in the occupants of the building. Sometimes it's, you know, it could be a headache, could be a cancer cluster, could be people dying in the building. Um, so I, 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 I I think the sick building and healthy building nomenclature, so to speak, works. I think it's correct. And, it and I think, importantly, we're speaking to the public, right? We could have these nuanced conversations, well, you know, but the, the public gets what a sick building is. Uh, it's a place you don't want to be. A healthy building? Yeah, it's going to keep me safe, protected, productive, healthy, happy. When that uh, acronym was first coined, though, you know, I think the, uh, the, the standard of measure then was, you know, if 80% of the occupants aren't experiencing issues, it was considered a healthy building. And, and I got to believe... <clears throat> We don't feel that way now. Well, that's not a, that's not a great metric. I, I, I agree. And I think um, we could talk about some of the standards. So the ventilation standard, for example, it's not quite based on the 80%, but ultimately it's a it's designed for uh, odor acceptability. Hey, the next person that's going to walk in this classroom that we're all in isn't going to leave because uh, it doesn't smell good because of the people in the room. Um, and then we could look at you know the 80%, for example, that comes up in the ASHRAE standard around thermal comfort. So we designed for 80% acceptability essentially but that doesn't feel acceptable to me i don't like it um i, I actually we had this class uh, i teach a healthy buildings class at harvard and uh we were talking about thermal health and thermal comfort just this week and one of the students says well that seems like a poor basis for design uh, one of the lecturers basically said it's kind of random how this this uh this um uh, standard really predicts actual overall comfort and then to know that you're designing for some acceptability for you know, not everybody comfortable in a building. I come from the other place. Like every building in a mid-home should be safe, provide a healthy, comfortable, productive work environment where everybody's satisfied. It's unacceptable that we've kind of taken our building stock and said, you know what? 20% of you are going to be miserable. Deal with it. That's the standard. Or, hey, the ventilation standard, we know it's too low. There's going to be lots of disease transmission here, influenza, COVID, RSV, but hey, that's our standard. Like, I think it's been a huge miss from a, I'm a public health professor, first and foremost. It's a huge miss in terms of public health. Sure. And I totally agree with that. So uh, you had an article in Harvard uh, Business Review last November uh, that I think was an appeal to companies to monitor their workplaces, right, for air quality, for the sake of their employees. Uh, at one point, you, you said, and I quote, uh, the, the days of company hiring someone like me, a certified industrial hygienist, to test a building with a $5,000 scientific instrument over a day and then write up a report are waning. What do you mean by that? Because I think, you know, some people took exception to that, but I, I, I know that your intent might be different than the way it was uh, interpreted by some. 
Yeah, it's very much a wake up call to industry and honestly to our profession. Look, I, I'm uh, I'm a proud certified industrial hygienist. Like I said, I train CIHs. In fact, it's one of the best certifications you can get. Every one of my students who gets their CIH ends up with a great a great job that pays well and is actually really rewarding. Before I get into that, you know, in my, we could easily pull a quote from my book, right? I, but because I, I want to give you a sense of what I think the importance of the CIH is in the healthy buildings movement, then I could talk about that. So I actually talk about this. When you look at the required education, experience, sample questions from the CIH exam, you'll quickly recognize their expertise is the science of healthy buildings. If something is found to be off, this group has the skill set to identify what that is and come up with a solution. We don't know about you, but we would feel better sitting in our healthy building if we knew a CIH was determining how healthy it was. So let's be clear. Um, the role and value of expertise, particularly the certified industrial hygienist, I even show exam questions in my book to show you how rigorous mm -hmm. it is or show the public. Um, that's not being questioned. I think what the, the article is really less about CIHs or occupational health and more a wake up call to organizations. Sure. You have to see what's happening in this industry. The proliferation of low cost sensors means that the, there's a power shift happening. Yes, you no longer have to have or the way it used to be, you'd hire CIH, get a lab report, come back. Very specialized, could be expensive. I'm not saying the low-cost sensors do everything you can do with a lab test or what a CIH can do, but it's the first time the public can actually go in and come back to you and say, hey, the TVOCs are high. That's never been available, right? This is a huge power shift that's happening. I also use the article to, as a wake-up call to companies to say, you know, there's actually legislation and, uh, and, and shifts happening in the field that you need to pay attention to. Boston Public Schools monitors air quality and reports on this for all their schools. Denver Public Schools, too. There's a couple of bills in New York City trying to pass this to have a requirement to have indoor air quality monitoring in buildings. Um, the CIHs I train or the occupational health experts I train, this is a big focus, and our field's going to have to adapt and adapt quickly. We've always had real-time instruments. That's not that new. Um, what we haven't had is a public that has had access to instruments, not quite scientific grade, but not terrible, and getting better. You can also see where this field is going. What we can measure today is a handful of things reliably. New monitors will come out. Eventually, will be able to formaldehyde in real time. The VTEX compounds, like, it's just going to keep growing where the public has access to these tools. Our field's becoming a real-time field and requires a different level of sophistication and skill around data analytics and sure. statistics. So that feels, we have, we do biostatistics in our field forever, but it's just changing. And the article isn't a knock on CIH. It's actually, like in my book, it's a, I call out explicitly that we need to have this level of expertise because I think a true danger is that you're going to have people interpreting this, these incorrectly. Sure. Pass these data along to uh, an IH, industrial hygienist, occupational health expert. They can interpret that. The public? Maybe take a cross section. I've had people send me screenshots. Hey, should I evacuate mm -hmm. my building? Hey, what does this mean? <laughs> right. What does it mean? So, uh, in fact, I think I think that's um, I can see why people would take issue with that sentence, but I think it's also a reality of, of how the the nature of the field is changing. And I and I end the piece I think with an important message. Right. These things aren't going away. These right. things being the public awareness is so high right now because of COVID. Two, the low cost sensors is not going away. It's proliferating. And a head in the sand approach to these new tools is a mistake. So I actually encourage companies, you don't have to go all in, but it's a good idea to start figuring out, hey, if I start monitoring my building, what are the analytics I have to do behind it? What's the response action? Who's responsible? Does your facilities director have to interpret this data? Actually, I'd say, no, you need a CIH checking out these data because if the facilities person, as talented as they are, they're not trained in how to interpret exposure and risk data. So um, they, this, I... I I was passionate about writing that piece because these are these are fundamental shifts for society uh, and our field. It, the, the growth of the healthy buildings movement, the reality we have these new low cost sensors, uh, and companies all just trying to figure out this space. And you already see schools and uh, and cities and states moving in this direction. I mean, it's a major paradigm shift, though, <clears throat> because obviously traditionally we did some real time monitoring right over the years, you know, but it, and that's evolved over the last decade or so. Uh, but for the most part, we were doing snapshot stuff as professionals in the industry. You go out and you're, even if you're doing an excursion for a day, there, there usually wasn't long-term uh, data sets to look at. Um, and, you know, and now, like like you said, with the advent of these uh, low-cost sensors that can really be 
you know, deployed everywhere. And in a lot of places you can have continuous monitoring that's at least trending all the time, right? But so I, I guess the well, question you know, there, okay. I'll mention one thing because, oh, no. you know, I was careful with my words. I said waning. I didn't say the year is over. I mean, right. I, um, I, I was out just last week with silicans and everything like everybody else. And, sure. you know, we're going to need some of these classic approaches. One, that's where the regulatory limits are set right now. So you need to be able to do this kind of work too. When something triggers in a building or even as just uh, pr proactive, you know, we're going to have to still go out and measure the full suite of VOCs and aldehydes and everything else we can measure with these uh, lab techniques. But I actually like these lower cost centers as just another tool in our belt. And honestly, if we don't get familiar with these, the public's getting really familiar with these. Sure. You know, they're, they're, they're these are a couple hundred bucks, maybe less. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're definitely down. They're they're affordable. You see them on, you know, you see them on Amazon. You see them everywhere. You know, retail stores are s selling these devices. So, yep. general cons and, and every, again, really, I think they really launched uh, heavily into the consumer eye during COVID, when people were kind of confined to their home space. I, I think consumers in general, right, started looking at these devices because they, I mean, these a lot of this, you know, lower cost long term monitoring stuff's been available for a while now, right? We, you know, seven eight years it's been on the market. Mostly. Yeah, I mean, on my team at Harvard, I think we, you know, we've been doing this for a long time too. We built these monitors from scratch. I think we've tested and used just about every monitor that's out on the market. We've run our own, developed our own calibration systems, and I think what we've noticed, and not think, um, the quality is getting better. And you expect this, and I mean both the sensor quality, but also the analytics and the calibrations and things like this. It's not scientific grade just yet, but I also think. For kind of, as I write my book, like keeping the pulse of the building, I'm not sure everybody needs a scientific grade instrument. In other words, reporting sure. CO2 plus or minus 10% for this kind of thing. Okay, in a research study, yeah, you don't want that. Regulatory study, nope, that's not nope. going to cut it. But here, I, I, I'd be all right with that. Well, you can see trends. I mean, I think that that's really the powerful tool there is that you can, you can see, even if it's not specifically accurate, you know, right down to 1% or even, you know, 5% resolution. You're going to see something starting to happen or a trend shift in the building. So I, I think totally agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. So, so you know, so let's let's talk a little bit about this new era of air monitoring, though, because again, I think this is a major paradigm shift for the industry, right? And and the and workplaces, you know, the thought I, I would say a decade ago, the thought of having workplace air monitoring was pie in the sky, right? We would, you really didn't see that. Um, so the, you know. There are low cost sensors and there's and there's all different levels that there's consumer low cost, right? The real inexpensive sensors. And then there's more of the uh, prosumer or, you know, industrial grade units that are still fairly inexpensive. I mean, I, you know, they're not five thousand dollar units. They're five hundred dollar units right. um, that can give you a little bit tighter resolution. Um, <clears throat> what professionals primed to do this work as far as going out and, uh, uh, you know, get, getting involved with implementing these type of systems and strategies for companies um and you know and, and where and where are these individuals getting trained and educated you know like well, who who do you envision as that yeah well let me address that first part and i you know i read the quote from my book there's a reason i put that in there um and the reason is this that uh it's one of my concerns that as we start implementing healthy building strategies whatever they are or as these sensors get cheaper that um there'll be people who think that you don't need expertise, right? And I think that's a huge mistake too. The, the reason I put CIHs in the book in particular is to say there's a level of rigor here that you can trust this person understands how to analyze data, understands controls, right? Understands risk communication, the things that are, that are in our rubrics. Um, because I think there, there, there's a, I don't want to call it a danger. I think it's a good thing that these proliferate, but I can see the scenario where company puts these up or, or school puts these up and says, hey, we have air quality monitoring. And it's like, well, now what? I actually think that's the easy part, picking out a sensor, sticking out of the wall. How do you interpret these data? We know it's tricky. What's the averaging time you're using? Who sets the thresholds for things that are non-regulatory? We could have a, a half hour discussion on what's the appropriate PM 2.5 limit or TVOC limit. I sure. mean, this stuff is nuanced. And, um, and I think that's where the real challenge is. And also, what, what, when do you respond? In other words, at what level do you uh, what is say, the uh, what is the team point? spot? Yeah. And at what level do you have to call in environmental health and safety? Uh, and I don't think groups have fully worked that out yet. And actually, in my article in Harvard Business Review, it's essentially a call for that. The last paragraph says, like, dip your toes in here. Start putting some of these sensors up because it's going to force you to think through these tricky things. Who on your team is qualified? 
Should you have to outsource this to an EHS expert? Can your EHS team handle it? Does it go to facilities? When do, when do you send out an alert? You, you know, or you could over alert these things. You get 600 alerts a day. That gets ignored. I think these are really hard questions. Um, and it's one of the reasons I wrote the article is basically say like, you need to get started because what's clear, like I said, the head in the sand approach isn't going to work. These things are sticking around. It's a good time to start getting familiar with what they can do, what they can't do, what the limitations are, and what's the expertise needed to deploy these, analyze the data, and all with the goal of making sure everyone stays safe and healthy in the building. Well, even talking about deployment, you know, what is was an appropriate number of sensors, uh, you know, per, per an area, where do you, where are they located, right? I mean, that, that changes everything. I mean, especially, if, you know, even if you have one every two or 3,000 square feet, as you proposed in your article, and that's, that's a fairly, uh, you know, high amount of sensors out in this space. But are they truly represented or what's the occupant density? Are, you know, are we monitoring occupant density in this space? That's the other thing. Yeah, I mean, we should be monitoring the occupants uh, <laughs> you know, for sure. Uh, the O2 levels really are, you know, if you have a thousand square feet, you have one occupant versus 20 occupants. That's right. Situation. But I'll tell you where that number came from about sensor density. And I, and I put it in there for a reason. It's because um, so I'm a scientist at heart and I saw what was out there on the market. Um, and I didn't like it. And I was advising companies. So full disclosure, I work with Amazon. They're an amazing company. Uh, the people there are, are bright. And they we helped roll out a global air quality monitoring system across their um, uh, their corporate real estate portfolio. But an important question comes up, you raise, like, well, where do you put these things and what's the density? And if you looked out and you searched, go ahead and search this stuff, you'll see that You'll see everything from one for every thousand square foot to one every 50,000 square feet. So every company out there, every group is telling you something different. So what my team and I did, because I didn't feel comfortable with any of that, it feels hand wavy, is we all actually built a model and it's kind of like a CFD model, but a quicker way to kind of iterate on what happens in the building. And we and it, we decided on that threshold based on gaseous and particle flows in a building. So in other words, I'll, I'll conceptualize it for you. We built this model to say, uh, there's a there's a waste paper basket on fire. That example, okay, it's generating particles over here. At what distance and what time would you detect the particle concentration? Not at the extreme high limit. You just need to be sure that you're going to detect it somewhere in that space such that someone responds and not looks right under the sensor, but knows their response radius would capture where the real issue is. So there's actually a science behind it. And I think our field is good at this stuff. Everything out there is very hand wavy. Why one for per 5,000 square feet? So I only felt comfortable re um, offering that up because I felt there wasn't a good basis out there. So we actually built a model to answer these questions, but it's all tied in. This is where the expertise and experience comes in. Is, is It depends on the threshold. It, mm -hmm. it depends on the volume of the space, the air, the air speed in the space, all the things we kind of keep track of. So there's that's not a randomly picked number. Uh, and I intentionally put it there because it, we built, had to build models to answer that question uh, for the public. I think people in our field will get a lot of these questions. And it's on us. I think we always do this in our field. There has to be a scientific basis. Hey, where are you going to put these things? What height? Why over there? What's happening to the ventilation system? So you have to ground that in something that's uh, that's defensible. Yeah. And, and that's really important to make those those uh, data sets be valid. I mean, right? I mean, because you know the data that you might collect from sensors could be wildly different just based on that placement, the density, all those, you know, those are, those are factors for consideration. Uh, in yeah, addition think about to, in addition what your exactly trade levels what? are. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. I, I think for, it also really, you know, we want to keep people safe and ability. So there's, there's a true risk that we're trying to manage, right? And you're also trying to manage that, you know, you don't somehow make the claim that, Hey, we're monitoring and there's some gap that you can't account for. Uh, and something slips through, right? So it is true. Once I think a lot of the reason a lot of organizations may be reluctant to get into this space is that when you start monitoring, um, you are really responsible then to have a program in place that analyzes the data, that stays on top of it, correctly flags issues and resolves them. Uh, now, everyone should have the responsibility in the first place. If you ask me, like we should be monitoring buildings. We should have been doing this forever and uh, and taking action ahead before like we use humans as the sensor that something's gone wrong. Um, but that's part of the, the responsibility. You start monitoring a building. You got to have the expertise and the team in place to take action if something goes awry. Yeah. And here here we are now. I mean, this this is the paradigm shift that we've been discussing. Um, in the, the uh, episode of 60 Minutes that you were on a few months back, um, I, it depicted a, a worksite monitoring system. Um, what, I, I guess, you know, and there, there was one that was, that was shown there briefly. Um, what does that secure monitoring room look like? You know, and the folks inside, you know, 
um, who are they, you know, in that room? And, you know, what is, what is their technical expertise if they're reviewing these uh, data sets? You know, that, but who, who's, yeah, so, who's the person you put in that room, Joe? Yeah, so I'll think of talking generalities because um, uh, there's a there was a company that was involved. You know, that, that was actually an Amazon building showing their air quality monitoring system. So let me just talk about in generalities about uh, some ideas of who I think needs to be at the table there. I think with some of these um, uh, parameters we're measuring, particles and TBOC, CO2, um, I think there's a level that you're trying to hit that's um, that we know is good and even optimal, right? So let's take CO2. I like under 800 parts per million as a threshold could be even lower. The science is pretty clear. There are benefits. A lot of people use 1,000 as the threshold. When it goes over 1,000, I don't think that has to escalate to environmental health and safety, right? That's something a facilities team can investigate and resolve. I think your system has to have the appropriate notification, sends them a note, they open a ticket, they resolve it, but it's not an evacuate the building moment. It's well within the bounds of what we typically see in fluctuations in a building to respond in due course. That said, as these levels increase for any of these, there should be an escalation up to someone, in my view, that would ultimately be environmental health and safety, right? So it doesn't have to be a certified industrial hygienist, but someone who's trained in environmental health and safety, uh, who can who understands data analysis, understands exposure, risk, and controls. So, but there's an escalation there. Otherwise, you know, some of these things be pinging, and, and your EH and S team would be getting pings all day, hundreds per right. day. And it becomes totally just you, you ignore it. It's data yeah. that never gets even considered. That's right. It, it's the alarm that goes off, and people just say, "Ah, oh, ignore it." Always goes off. Um, and you, we don't want that, that either. So ultimately, I think it does escalate when it starts to hit levels that are truly, um, you know, start to get into health and safety type issues or that that flag that something's not quite right in the building. That's one of the reasons I like coming to the lower cost sensors. You have some kind of at least something that's taking the pulse of the building at all times. It may not be that we're that concerned about CO2 or even PM 2.5, but if these things start fluctuating in a way that tells you something's not quite right, that's important information, right? And that means you need to look under the hood. And then you can also understand if you have a network of these sensors, is this one localized area? Are the two sensors on the same floor responding the same way as a floor level issue? You have a whole suite of sensors up and down the building responding. You have a building level issue. You have a suite of sensors across your buildings. This is a regional phenomenon like wildfire smoke or an outdoor air pollution event. So there's lots of great insights you can get, and it doesn't even have to be about that specific parameter. They kind of just tell you a little bit about maybe something's not quite happening right uh, in your building, a filtration issue, a uh, damper stock or something. Sure, sure. Well, you know, and, and what's interesting about that is, like, um, I envision this, you know, as, as we get into these moder ongoing monitoring systems in the workplace, there's probably, you know, I, I envision many places will have a public dashboard, right, that will actually show, you know, buildings will opt to have, monitors in their lobby or, so, you know, some, some screens that actually show what's going on. And I, I and that raises the question in my mind, you know, does, does this data, uh, you know, and the numbers that they represent, does general, will the general public have an understanding of that? What, what will it mean to them? You know, like how, how do you distill the information that's gleaned from these ongoing monitoring systems and report it in a way that general population, you know, John Q public can look at it and it means something and isn't misconstrued and alarming. Yeah, absolutely critical question. I think it's one of the most challenging. And uh, the companies I work with and advise, we spend a lot of time on this because it's the most challenging and maybe one of the most important aspects. I've seen uh, many groups start with that. I think that's a mistake to say like, hey, here's what we envision is going to go out to the public. And it's like, hold on, let's get the monitors up. Let's get familiar with the data. How are we going to respond? And then figure out what is the... Um, What's the best way to communicate this? And it could vary by company too and population. Boston Public School is just saying, here's all the data. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are better approaches to that, right? I think I think you want to give people the data. I don't mean, I should be careful there. I don't mean like, hey, here's the data done. But I right. think you don't want to hide anything, but some kind of, it's incumbent upon us, we do this all the time in our field, to summarize to different audiences. Right. If I was presenting to other eh &S professionals, we be technical. If I was presenting to a public about something that happened, um, I would use different language and explain it differently. Sure. And I think we just have to take that lens. The back-end dashboard can be really technical, maybe geared towards facilities, environmental health and safety. The executives probably want a different dashboard too, a summary dashboard. You're also going to want a public, if you're going to have a public-facing dashboard, that has to convey 
um, different information. I think it's really tricky. We've been working on this for a long time. I think we've unlocked a couple ideas that are that uh, help communicate it. In other words, you summarize it in a meaningful way. It's, it's real time or close to it. You provide some of the data with interpretation, with links for more information. There's going to be different levels of sophistication. Um, but I, I would guard against one thing, and, and you mentioned this. I think we should not underestimate the public. In other words, to say that, I certainly won't. To say like, well, is this beyond them or incapable? The public's really smart, particularly around topics they care about. If they're in a building that's not performing that well. You can guarantee they're going to become expert on a topic very quickly. Look at the medical field. deals with this all the time. We all go into the doctor's office, and we're not physicians, but certainly we do our homework before you go to the doctor if you're going to meet about something. Similar here. I'll give you an example. Just last week, I was presenting on this topic to a, a group, uh, no, I would say non-experts, just a, an interested general public group. Two young women came up to me afterwards. Um, they monitor air quality in their home. And I'm telling you, we had a sophisticated conversation. Okay. They knew about the PM 2.5 limits. They knew how to interpret TVCs. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying they're environmental health and safety professionals, but the public is starting to get savvy with this stuff. And that's one of the reasons I raised that in my article is like, as kids grow up in schools with air quality monitors, it's going to become, it's no longer novel to them. Sure. Parents are going to be more used to this stuff. Uh, it's not that wild. It's like a thermostat eventually, right? Every building is measuring temperature. Like they'll be measuring these kind of things. People start to get really familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, uh, and I think if you put these sensors up in a building, uh, and you don't explain very carefully what it is, what you're monitoring, who is responsible for responding if there's an event, or start to share something about it. That's not going to fly either. That's that's saying like, hey, we have these sensors here. Don't look don't look behind the curtain. Exactly. Like that's not going to work either. So you have to, the, the risk. I mean, this is part of our field. Risk communication is is uh, is it's essential. Paramount. It's paramount. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's paramount. What, yep. If you think about it, even traditionally over the years, you know, we've been out in the field, you know, taking devices and measurement and immediately, right, the occupants in the space, if you walk in with a monitor or a device, I mean, right, there's a plethora of questions that follow that. You have to explain why we're doing this and what, what we're doing. And, and I think as this becomes more commonplace and it gets implemented, I think people would just, this will be maybe a standard expectation, like like you said, as like a, a thermostat, you know, pretty, pretty uh, less novel, I, I guess I would put it that yeah. way. Yeah, the novelty is it will wear off, right? Kind of soon. Well, and, and the other thing too, I mean, our workplaces in general, you know, there's some evolution there since you know post pandemic. I think a lot of a lot of the businesses have people working from home, even part you know part of the week or whatever. And there's obviously there's a lot of there's a lot of careers that don't allow for that, but a, you know a lot do, right? That you know people are staying from home. So now you now you have the workplace in many cases is actually the home environment. But the home environment's not really geared to be the workplace, right? So th that this raises another whole set of uh, issues, does it not? Yeah, for sure. And you'll have to invite me back because um, my team at Harvard, we launched a, a, a study we call Homework. Uh, it's, so, so it's exactly answering this question. For, for some uh, careers, you're able to work at home, hybrid, whatever it is. But yeah, I'm in a room that used to be a, um, a kid's nursery when I had little kids. It's an office, wasn't geared towards it. I'll use my head to block my sensor over there because I don't even want to show you what, what's happening in this space. It wasn't designed to be an office, right? So, um, uh, you know, my I don't have a dedicated ventilation system here. I got, I, I have to crank open the window. This is what what a lot of people are, are, uh, are facing. And so anyway, we launched this home work study to start answering some of these questions about how your air quality in your home influences cognitive function and work productivity. So we know there's lots of great studies on air quality and, and at home and, and sleep or particles while you're cooking and and uh, chemicals that come out of a, a gas stove, right? So this is getting attention again, which is good. Um, it's good that it's getting attention. But uh, we're trying to do some of the work we've done on um, related to workers in corporate facilities. And we see links between air quality and cognitive function. And do we see those same uh, impacts. These papers are now submitted uh, for peer review, so they'll be published um, kind of soon, but I don't think it should surprise anybody. My expectation, or uh, let's call it a hypothesis, is that, yeah, the indoor air quality in your home office matters, just like the air quality in your sure. office at work also matters. Yes, yeah. makes total sense. Um, and, and obviously, I know you spend a lot, and you have spent a lot of time uh, in both your book and a lot of the presentations that I've uh, had the opportunity to watch you do, uh, speaking about schools, too. School environment is basically... Uh, 
you know, right, the uh, workplace for young adults. Yeah, and and there the literature is really deep on on really the profound impact that air quality is having on our students. We can look, we see impacts on air quality on uh, reading comprehension, on math test scores, heat and thermal issues influencing uh, test scores of high school students. And and what's interesting to me is if you look across the world, in any age group, we see this effect. We see studies of third graders in the U.S. Uh, and and over our own team's work on college students. We have new work right now on graduate students. Um, so with a full range of kids, let's call it, and and uh, in learning environments. And uh, as a parent, like this has always really frustrated me. And my Harvard team released a report we call Schools for Health. And it talks about all the ways the school building influences student thinking, student health, and student performance. And we open it with the framing that, you know, what do parents think about when they think about schools? The things I think about as a parent. Wow. How do I how do I get to school? What's lunch going to be like? What are the subjects? How are the teachers? Right. Um, what's the schedule going to be like? And, and but we never ask about the school building, and this is influencing the kids, but also the workers in the building, the teachers. Um, and it's study after study after study that shows this. So um, I was very active during the pandemic, trying to provide and build. Uh, get information out to school superintendents. I worked with, I advised the White House, I advised state uh, leaders at any school or union or superintendent or parent or teacher ever called me. I answered every call for four years during the pandemic. I'm trying to get some of these solutions into schools uh, to keep kids in school, but also keep kids and teachers safe. Basic improvements around filtration um, and ventilation. And really it was the first time, at least in the U.S., where we really had an influx of serious uh stimulus or pandemic dollars to actually make a dent in what had been and still is decades of neglect. And some sure. of our schools, you see the issues are uh, just unconscionable uh, lead in drinking water, asbestos oh, yeah. that's, you know, uh, that's not, you know, locked up a- outside of some of these basics of uh, basics of air quality and water quality mm-hmm. and sanitation, honestly. So it, it's kind of, um, it's been hard to uh, to see for forever how we've kind of neglected our school infrastructure. It's really hard, extra hard during the pandemic. I think it opened a lot of people's eyes to just how deficient that was and how important it was to be sure we dealt with schools right. I also think in schools is where we see a major equity issue when it comes to the healthy buildings issue. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Right? You see ventilation standards are too low. Universally, everyone in our field knows this and accepts this, but we, we haven't mustered the strength to change these. But they're design standards too. So what happens... Performance slips over time. And we see this. Ventilation in schools, about half of that minimum standard. Sure. We also see lower ventilation rates in schools with predominant Black or Hispanic populations. We also see even lower ventilation rates in schools where the majority of kids are on free or reduced lunch, so low income. Mm-hmm. So it's totally unacceptable for a million reasons. Oh, totally and it, disproportionate. Yeah. Those most in need, it's disproportionate impacts uh, and the disparity is widening. And I uh, one of the reasons I was very motivated during the pandemic, particularly the past year or two, is to make sure the, pen, the stimulus dollars, some of it got directed to the school building to rectify, you know, what's really been decades of yeah. uh, just neglect of our buildings. And by neglecting our buildings, we've been neglecting our students and our teachers. Yeah, it's, it's and I've spent a lot of time in my career too, working in schools as an environmental consultant. And yeah, it's it's amazing the disparity between, you know, the different socioeconomic school districts and how, you know, how, how that stuff's been handled. Um, one of the things that I, that I, I want to get your opinion on it, um, during the pandemic, pandemic, the stimulus money, you know, billions of dollars becoming available for schools to do things, but not, in my opinion, great directive on how they could, how they should implement these funds. And, you know, we'll get into specific technologies, but a lot of things, you know, were brought, you know, rushed to market and, you know, pushed where like easy solutions, silver bullet, mag- magic cures that a school district could implement. And, you know, as opposed to the whole laborious task of designing new HVAC systems and spending a year or two going out to bid and getting that all done. So, did we miss the mark a little bit? We had a lot of money available, but did we really give them the support they needed to be able to make good purchase decisions? Well, I um, say we tried like hell, and I, I think it's a collective we. Um, yeah, I, 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 
our guidance, and I was a commissioner on the Lancet COVID-19 commission. I chaired the Lancet's task force on safe schools, safe work, and safe travel. I had wonderful colleagues, uh, experts from around the world working with us on this. And we, we tried to keep it really simple um, for that reason, that I think it was easy for schools to make mistakes at no fault of the schools. So in other words, yeah, it's kind of boring, uh, you know, hey, get some better ventilation going, upgrade the filters, open up a window, put a, put in a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter. It's kind of all we we're saying, uh, and, and I think that's reasonable as, as good practice. But yeah, of course, I think when the when the stimulus dollars flowed, there were opportunists, right? We sold more bells and whistles, uh, new technology. There's that, I don't think that's been fully uh, uncovered, let's say, about the extent of, mm-hmm. of uh, what was out there. But, you know, again, it's talking about another place where our field is really valued. I think a lot of schools got it perfectly right. Oh, absolutely. A lot of times when they worked with an engineer, environmental health and safety specialist, right? Industrial hygienist, people who kind of know this space. Um, But uh, a lot of schools, unfortunately, were, were, um, you know, it either didn't happen or maybe, uh, what's the right way to say it? It could have been done a lot lot better. I don't think it's the fault of the schools at all. Yeah. I mean, well, well, to your point, too, I, I think you know, the schools that really got it right, a lot of the schools were larger school districts with bigger resources with, that had, you know, that the ability to have the environmental health professionals and everybody helping them on these things. Whereas maybe some of the schools that were already, you know, in, in worse circumstances due to the socioeconomic, they're less apt to also have the guidance to implement these things, maybe. I mean, I, I, I saw it across the board. Sounds like you work a lot in this space. Like, I saw uh, schools with no resources uh, get it done well. I saw mm-hmm. big districts get it done. I saw big districts fail. I, I think I've seen saw it across the spectrum. Um, it seemed like when there was uh, a will and and uh, could break through some of this stuff that that uh, that that schools could get it done. But I also understand the reality. You hey, you're a big district. You're dealing with a million things. Trying to you have kids out of school. How are you going to get the IT, the computer? Like the complexity is massive. You have a pandemic. It's a scary time. And now you get handed a lot of money and says, okay, fix all these problems. And it's like, well, I don't know. Someone comes in and tells me, yeah, this is going to solve my COVID problem. If I just do X, Y, and Z, okay, I get why you you might sign up for that, something like that. But I think, you know, we, my um, the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, our task force, I think we released a really important report um, where we got together and just said, you know, there's lots of things out there now and it's confusing. What are the things we just did a handful of things, but really lift the bar for everybody in schools and everywhere else. And we wrote a report called the first four healthy building strategies. Every building should pursue. And they're absolute basics. First one, commission your building, give your building a tune up, saves energy, improves air quality. It's a climate mitigation measure. Like that's just good practice. The ROI is just a couple of years. So give your building a tune up one increase ventilation, improve ventilation as best you can. Three, Upgrade your filters from these kind of low cost, cheap, protect the equipment filters to filters that protect people, MERV 13 or higher. And then then you can start to get into these other strategies around, well, do you monitor indoor air quality and use a portable air cleaner? But really, if you did those strategies, you could uh, increase the equivalent air change per hour in a school from the design standards about three. A lot of schools are getting one and a half for ventilation. You could get up to four, five, six or higher equivalent air changes, pretty low cost, right? And yeah, commissioning it should be cost neutral after a couple of years on the energy savings. Absolutely. So I, I I think, I've said this for a long time, I think in a lot of ways we've been overcomplicating the healthy buildings movement. Uh, I, I don't think it's that hard to, to create a healthy building. It's definitely not just for the shiny skyscraper, great new building starting from scratch. We've all been in these buildings that, are underperforming at some point, a little bit of love, a little bit of attention, a little bit of investment doesn't even be, have to be that much. And you can really improve the condition of the space inside and then really influence in a positive way the health of, of everybody who's in that who's in that building. So, so Joe, your, your article in the Harvard Business Review back in November really was, you know, you made this as a call to action, not just to businesses probably, but to the industry in general, to the industrial hygiene and uh, occupational environmental health and safety professionals that business as usual probably isn't the way we're going to move forward successfully. Well, yeah, I mean, the, these these shifts are happening. The, the scientific and medical literature is being entirely rewritten uh, around airborne spread. We have the public's, we've captured the public's imagination. Uh, I don't mean that in a bad way, that this is now really quite important. Look, uh, 
our, our field uh, 60 minutes covered indoor air quality. Who would have thought that would happen? If you paid attention this summer, um, New York Times had a multi-part series on the new war on bad air. And they weren't talking about bad outdoor air, the new war on bad indoor air. New York Times, A1, top story, top of the fold if you get the print paper. Like, that's, our field has never uh, been uh, talked about in that kind of way. So the public awareness is high as ever been. The medical and scientific community uh, is lighting up. You have new technology out there that we have to figure out how to incorporate into our assessment here. And the article is really a, a wake-up call or, or an announcement actually to companies to say like, hey, you know, you should start thinking about these tools. They're going to start showing up in your kid's school and your employee's kid's school. They want to start getting familiar with it. In the article, I introduced some basics, you know, for, and this is a for executives, not scientists. What is sure. sulfur dioxide? What's PM 2.5? How do I think about where to deploy these? How many do I need? Um, so that's really was the focus of the article. And let me be reiterate, like I, like I said in my book, and, and dedicated a lot of space to it. Um, th there's a need for expertise here, and probably even more so because um, now it's the proliferation of these, and you have many more organizations with access. Some might think, hey, I'm going to stick this central on the wall, forget about it, I'm done. Yeah, that's unless you have the uh, safety and health professional behind that, um, that's a recipe for disaster uh, for people in the building, but also in terms of how you're going to respond. Yeah, so for, for those who you know might be fearing the paradigm shift, old curmudgeons like myself, uh, you know, the reality is there's a lot more opportunity in the in industry on this side. Um, as this moves forward, you know, em embrace the technology or, you know, evolve or be left behind. I think that's right. This is a major opportunity for our field. And, and of course, we've always been evolving since our field was um, founded. And, and like we've talked about during this, uh, during this chat, you know, it's things we've already been doing. So you mentioned, you know, you get someone out in, um, in a building with an instrument, they have to talk to the public. What are you monitoring? Sure. And you have to do it in a way you don't alarm them. And so you, you're, you're informed naturally. So risk communication is part of our field. Data analytics. We've been doing data analytics all the time. So that's part of our field. Biostatistics. That's part of the rubrics too. Exposure, risk assessment, sensor technology. It's actually a really exciting time. And I liked how you framed it there. Um, it's it's actually an expansion of the market, so to speak, sure. for, uh, for, for expertise, for, for this kind of expertise. In our field, a lot more companies who maybe didn't even have EHS programs, people, consultants, advisors, are now going to be seeing these things, and they're going to be asking these questions: What do, what sensor do I use? How do I interpret the data? What should I do when it reads X, Y, and Z? Uh, and and so our field is uh, is the right field to uh, to to lead this movement. Well, Joe, I'm going to take you up on coming back at a later date to talk uh, talk a bit more about this stuff. Uh, Absolute pleasure to have you here. Thanks for taking time out of I'm, what I'm sure is an extremely busy day. And uh, we, again, look forward to more of what you're doing and more of what's coming out. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me on. Enjoyed the conversation. Thanks. So that's our show for this week. Until next time, I'm Bob Krell. Stay healthy.